Um, <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadeem Mia. I'm the Portfolio Manager for Sherry Portfolio Canada. Uh, Jazakallah khair uh, for joining us today on, um, uh, on this uh, beautiful day in Ramadan. Uh, today's topic, um, you know, for our webinar will be on the topic, the very important topic of zakat. Uh, and with us uh, is our guest speaker, um, Sheikh Arij Anwar. Um, and again, the, the topic will be on income investment and zakat. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're all, we also have, <clears throat> you know, uh, we're collaborating with uh, Penny Appeal on, on this as well. Uh, so every year we do like to kind of uh, highlight uh, a particular charity. Uh, we understand there are many, um, you know, great charity organizations out, out there uh, that, that are doing great work. Uh, so this year we did want to just, you know, particularly highlight Penny Appeal, of course, you're free to choose uh, any, uh, uh, you know, uh, organization for your zakat. But, um, you know, so uh, we have a brother, Riyadh uh, Rahmat, uh, who will say a few words on that. So with that, we'll get started. Um, uh, just some quick household notes here. Uh, one second here. Okay. Uh, just a quick disclosure. Uh, you know, this is uh, something that, you know, Share Portfolio needs to do. Um Nothing that we say here is everything that we say is for informational purposes only. Um, you know, no, there's no financial advice uh, that that you know, and anything we say shouldn't warrant any financial advice. We, of course, you know, uh, uh, recommend that you speak to your financial advisor. Uh, on the topic of zakat, though, uh, most of my previous webinars are kind of related around investment, so this is one of those webinars that I truly enjoy because I'm the host and I don't have to do a lot of the thinking. We, we, we hand that off to our guest speakers who, who will probably answer most of the questions. But inshallah, um, so, but I do want to say just a couple of few things uh, for, especially for our newcomers uh, who don't, who aren't familiar with Sharia portfolio, who are we? Uh, we are, well, we, we are basically, our roots start in 2003 uh, with our uh, CEO and founder, Noshad Virji. Uh, where you know he had a small family office and he was operating uh, basically you know money for family and friends and trying to offer some type of sharia compliant investment solutions. Uh, Alhamdulillah, in the U.S., the business grew to 26 states by 2014. We expanded the team, uh, SEC registered, and again the goal in the U.S. was simply to help Muslim Americans reach their financial objectives, but making sure that they do it in a sharia compliant way. Um, of course, with the growth in our community here, uh, you know, it, it gave reason for us to expand into Canada. So essentially, basically in 2019, 2020 is, is when we officially uh, landed in Canada. And as a result, we're, we're registered with the Ontario Securities Commission and uh, we're registered right now in four provinces in Ontario, BC, Alberta and Quebec. Um, and uh, of course, you know, some of you might know us from our uh, ETFs, SP funds, uh, where currently we have three ETFs uh, that trade on the New York Stock Exchange, SPUS, SPSK, and SPRE. Uh, but specifically on Sharia Portfolio Canada, like I mentioned, our goal is simply to help Muslim Canadians reach their financial objectives, but making sure that we do it in a Sharia compliant way. We are a service company, uh, meaning we provide that financial advisory more so than just simply, you know, uh, selling a product. As mentioned, we are registered in the four provinces that I mentioned. Um, and like I said, we're, we're truly dedicated into, uh, you know, this space. We don't have any products that are non-Sharia. Um, and so as a result, you know, uh, and, and we do manage these portfolios on a discretionary basis. We follow the IOFI guideline, um, and I'll talk maybe a little bit about that. Um, and we are partnered up with um, Fidelity Clearing Canada. Fidelity, um, which the parent company, is one of the largest financial institutions in the world. And so we try to, you know, give our clients that um, uh, sense of security that, you know, their assets are being held with a global financial institution. And we have two uh, types of offerings, active and passive. Um, I'm not going to get into that uh, too much in detail today, since the topic of today is more related to Zakat. Uh, IOF, that is the standard that we follow from a Sherry compliance standpoint. Um, and uh, IOF essentially is uh, a Sharia council based in Bahrain, has about, I think, 20 scholars from 10 different countries. These are some of the, um, you know, uh, the scholars uh, name that you see her on the board. And uh, ultimately, this, this is the Islamic rule book that we follow uh, as a firm. Uh, they've given us the guidelines as far as what investments are deemed to be Sharia compliant or not. 
And of course, as, you know, Allah knows best, but you know, we try our best to implement this fatwa uh, when it comes to screening our investments. A little bit about myself. I am, like I said, I'm the portfolio manager. My role is to do some of the financial advising, but at the same time, manage uh, the, the model portfolios of our firm. Um, been around the block for a few years, 25 years in the industry, um, you know, with uh, various firms, uh, mostly, you know, in Oppenheimer, uh, HSBC, and so forth. I joined Sherry Portfolio in 2019. So most of my space has kind of been outside, but the last four years, alhamdulillah, have been a, a truly a blessing, you know, with a firm like this, as I'm able to do two things that I'm very passionate about uh, investing and at the same time, you know, um, help me on the on the, on the dean side. So um, I'm originally from Montreal, Bachelor of Commerce from Concordia, and I am a CFA charter holder. Um, and this is just some of the value that we add as a firm. We're independent, um, we're, you know, we're an independent investment uh, full service firm. So meaning to say we're not product, we're not selling any particular products. We, we have access to any product as long as, of course, it's cherry compliant and it al aligns with our values. Um, we have a very experienced team uh, behind me. Um, Nashad uh, Virji, who is our CEO and founder, he's you know been in the business just you know, 25 years, just as long as I have. And um, we also have you know our compliance officer who also has been uh, in the business for 25 years and has actually managed a pension fund in the past. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of maybe, you know, um, stop there. I mean, we have an app. Uh, I encourage everyone who hasn't downloaded to download it. Um, you know, there is a purification calendar there and things of that sort. Even if you're not a client, I welcome you to, uh, you know, log, uh, you know, download it. If you want to become a client, this would probably be a good place to go. You can download the app. There's a get started tab and you can, you know, put your information there. One of my team members will be in touch. So with that, um, I'm going to pause there and I'll just give a quick intro uh, to um, our, our first speaker um, who from Penny Appeal, Brother Riyad Rahmat. Um, he is the CFO, I believe, right? Uh, uh, brother, brother finance director. Finance, okay. yeah. Director yeah. of finance. Director of finance, yeah. So he will be saying a few words on... Um, on the the you know Penny Appeal, uh, who they are, what they've been, some of the great work that they've been doing, and so uh, Brother Riyad, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair. Salam alaikum, everyone, and uh, you know uh, thank you all for having me share your portfolio. Uh, we're happy to be here to share who we are in terms of Penny Appeal and all the good works that we've been doing out there. And so, without with that, I just would like to share my screen and give everyone an idea of who we are. So Penny Appeal, so we are a charity and we do a lot of work across the, the world. Um, we are just Penny Appeal Canada, but there's also Penny Appeal UK, Penny Appeal Australia, Penny Appeal US. So we are part of a bigger or wide, part of a bigger organization, but we and ourselves here in Canada, we do quite a bit of, uh, you know, of charity work. Some of our programs, we have often kind, uh, which is where we help with, you know, orphans across the world, uh, bringing a brighter future to them uh, in various different ways, um, education, by helping them with school supplies, by even helping them with nutritional needs. Uh, that's some of the things that we do. We do have a, a zakat program where we collect zakat funds here in Canada and we distribute in a zakatable way across uh, all of our, pro or, so, but some of our programs, the one that are eligible for zakat. Um, then we have another program, which is Thirst Relief, uh, where we build wells and uh, we provide clean and safe drinking water to a lot of countries where it's needed. And uh, I'll touch a little bit more on that. Um, the other one is Feed Our, Feed Our World, which is a program which we try to provide food, you know, basic food items to people of poorer nations. Uh, we have Education First, which we try to support our students, uh, both here locally and abroad as well. Um, we have a, a Kika program. Of course, when you have your newborn, we have a program with that. We have our Love Palestine program. We have emergency response. So whenever there is an emergency, we have partners on the ground who we are ready to help and assist in any way we can. Um, of course, you know, this is done in a structured way where we, the help goes to where it's most needed. Uh, the most recent one uh, of these programs was the Turkey 
Syria, uh, Pakistan, that, uh, I'm sorry, Turkey, it was Turkey, Syria earthquake relief was the re most recent one that we did back in February. Um, and these are just some of the main programs that we do. Um, the one I just wanna focus because today's topic is on Zakat. I just wanna talk a little bit more about our Zakat pro program. So of all the monies that we collect on our Zakat program, it's uh, we have a 100% Zakat policy. So what that means is that of all the monies you donate to us, we as Penny Appeal do not take an admin fee out of it. 100% gets put into the program and gets to the person in need or you know wherever those programs are to, to uh, that is accountable. Um, of course, from our website, you can basically go in and click whether it's a monthly donation or whether you want to do a one-time donation. Uh, we have an option to calculate and then you can donate. These programs, which I've briefly mentioned before, Feed Our World, Orphan Kind and Thirst Relief, are three Zakat eligible programs, which uh, your Zakat will go towards. Um, there's a little bit of how we go about uh, dealing with in terms of our administrative side. So to give you a level of comfort of how we deal with your zakat, we have a separate bank account where we keep those zakat funds uh, separate from all our other funds. We here in Canada do not have any administrative fees. So we don't take any fees. The zakat, right, it goes to Muslims first to ensure that the recipients, we ensure that those recipients are eligible to receive those zakat. And our team and our third party, they make sure that uh, wherever the zakat are going, they are eligible for zakat. Uh, we do have one you know, part of the fees um, to a maximum of 10%. It's not necessarily 10%, it's a maximum of 10%, uh, where we do pay uh, some of our implementing partners. And the reason for this is we do, they do have people across there who uh, work you know, with us and they get a little bit of a salary to distribute some of these zakats and make sure that everything is done properly. So that's where a little bit of money goes. And then at the end of these projects, they re our partners report back to us and we post it up on our site. This you will see, we have um, our 2021, 2022. You'll see those different reports on zakat, how it was spent, where it went, what would be the, the, the impact of that zakat. So we do come back and we report to it. So we are transparent in that basis as well. Uh, so that's basically, I just wanted to get into a little bit of guidelines about us and how we deal with zakat so that you are comfortable in terms of the way your zakat are being distributed. Um, the, the other part of it is, uh, give me a quick second here, this thing is blocking me. Oh, there we go. Let me just move this here. Um, so the other part and is that, you know, we, we've adopted sort of a little bit of a motto for this, uh, this period, which is that we wanna make sure no one gets left behind Right? So we're trying to help as much people as possible. One of our goals we would like to see is that when there's a will, when a charity like us is no longer needed, meaning that people out there do no longer require our help because they have been able to sustain themselves. But until that time, we are here fully 120% out there to support them. Um, we have a number of programs where you, uh, you know, that are coming up during Ramadan. Uh, March 25th, this was yesterday in Calgary. We have uh, in today, uh, another one of these galas, Ramadan galas happening in Edmonton. On April 1st, there's one happening in London, Ontario with Dr. Munir Al-Qasim. On April the 7th, we have one in Mississauga uh, with Sheikh Allah and um, Ustad Mustafa Briggs. We also on April the 7th, we have one in Siri, BC with uh, Sheikh Nasser Janga and Abdul Shihab. And of course, on April the 15th, we have our last gala, Ramadan gala, where uh, uh, here in Oakville, right here in the GTA on April the 15th. So I encourage each and every one of you to, you know, try and attend because like I said, our work is supporting. And in this time of Ramadan, we should try to get as much blessings as possible. And so we, this is one of the ways in which we can help contribute to our programs which we would then implement to, to where is most needed. And lastly, uh, we as a charity, we offering you, you the donors, uh, you the people out here in Canada, an opportunity to even do more with your Ramadan. 
and that is by help of volunteering with us here in Canada. You can become a volunteer, part of our, what we call Team Orange, and you become a volunteer with us and you can help. We have lots of local programs where we, we distribute food to the needy. Uh, right uh, yesterday, there was a program going on, 160 meals we, dis we distributed in the GTA. So you can be part of that. It's an opportunity again for not only you, but for all of us to improve our Ramadan, increase our blessings in Ramadan by being part of something like this. And of course, in the question and answer session, I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. With that, I'll pass it back to you now, Nadim. All right, Jazakallah, Brother Riyad, and uh, thanks again uh, yeah. for, for that update. Uh, you know, actually, I, I dropped off my daughter at one of your volunteer events right now at a food bank. So, right. you know, I, I encourage uh, everyone to obviously, you know, especially given with the month of Ramadan, to increase that. Um, yes. Now, uh, the next part of our webinar, of course, is our main event. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, on the, of course, on the topic of Zagat, and of course, you know, as um, the world is starting to change. I think Zakat is getting a little bit more complicated. And with us today is Sheikh Ariz Anwar, who I think is really, really well versed on this topic. And so just a little bit about Sheikh Ariz Anwar. He serves as the Muslim chaplain at Western University. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Commerce of Computer Science in Water at Waterloo, Bachelor of Education from Toronto, and a Bachelor of Islamic Science in Islamic Jurisprudence at Al Madina International University in Malaysia. He also, he's also a Zakat advisor to the uh, National Zakat Foundation and Launch Good. Uh, in the past, he has served as a director of religious affairs at the London uh, Muslim Mosque, where he helped the community navigate the trauma of our London family tra tragedy. Uh, he appeared on numerous TV and radio shows to give a voice to the Muslim community's pain and to appeal for change. He continues support for local initiatives uh, for inclusivity and anti-Islamophobia. So with that, uh, Sheikh Arij, I will give you the floor and Jazakallah khair once again for giving us uh, this time to, uh, you know, and your presence. Jazakallah khair and uh, thank you very much, Brother Nadeem, Brother uh, Riyad, uh, for the uh, beautiful presentation on uh, Penny Appeal and for the kind words, uh, Brother Nadeem, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you all. Alhamdulillah, at Ramadan is always a time I think we are uh, discussing uh, zakat and this is a beautiful thing because uh, a lot of us pay our zakat in Ramadan uh, because we want to earn the extra blessings of paying zakat in Ramadan and you know the two pillars happening at the same time uh, in the same month is uh, you know brings about more of, of that that baraka and the interesting thing is that a zakat is something that uh, it's it's a, it's a it, all of the deen actually generally should be uh, studied and reviewed and that is something that is a tradition that we have as Muslims. We're very proud of that tradition, that our deen is a deen of, uh, of that, that emphasizes education, all types of education, of course, but specifically uh, an ongoing education to the sacred sources. Uh, and zakat is, uh, you know, a timely thing. You know, it's uh, to be uh, performed once a year at a particular time. And when that time comes about, which is Ramadan, usually for most people, it's really nice to talk about it again, to revive our understanding, to make sure that we do it correctly. We do it with conviction. We're not doing it second guessing ourselves. Uh, that's the beauty and that's the sweetness of worship where we do it and we're like, yes, this is how it was supposed to be done. And I feel confident, I feel happy and I pray that Allah accepts. So that is the intent that once we do this webinar, uh, and we do it, you know, on a yearly basis. The idea is to bring about that revival, uh, that reconnection with zakat. So when you do give your zakat, inshallah, to worthy causes, you feel confident and you feel like you have fulfilled your obligation with knowledge and understanding. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I am going to share my screen here. Uh, let me uh, let me do this right here. Stop number two. Okay, uh, you can see my screen, yes? Uh, maybe Brother Nadeem or Brother Wright can tell me. Yeah, yes, we're seeing it. <laughs> All right, great, <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so let's uh, talk about uh, Zakat and what is our agenda today. We'll begin a little bit more broadly by talking about the view that we are, have as Muslims of wealth. And this is particular, uh, this, is, uh, this is important and 
and, and relevant because Share Your Portfolio uh, is a organization, is a company that uh, helps you manage your wealth and grow your wealth. So what is the view of Islam that our deen teaches us on wealth? It's important that we uh, kind of set the table for that. Then we'll talk about the reasons why we give zakat. Along with it being a pillar of Islam, there are actually other benefits. And when we are intentional and mindful of that, when we give our zakat, those benefits are attained. Um, we'll talk about what is zakat specifically, uh, meaning, and we'll use the word zakatable, right? Like it's a play on word on taxable, but please don't conflate the two. Uh, you know, taxes are on your income. Uh, zakat is on your wealth, your you know, what you have saved, very big difference. And often taxes are paid without feeling very happy about it. Zakat is paid and you feel very happy that you paid just cats. Big difference, inshallah. But you're going to use the word just for the sake of, uh, you know, giving it a term. Uh, wealth that is zakatable means that you pay zakat on it. Wealth that isn't zakatable is wealth that you do not pay zakat on. And we'll cover examples of that. Uh, we'll talk about who gives zakat and who receives zakat. Yes, this is important because, uh, you know, we have, people who uh, may be zakat eligible, but we don't recognize that they are. It's important that we understand who these people are. And also we maybe have situations, particularly with you know high inflation and everything being so expensive, people who are no longer uh, required to give zakat because you know the threshold that's required of them, they have not cleared it, you see? So we will discuss those uh, uh, items as well. And when to give zakat, we'll speak about it. Uh, not just like give your zakat in Ramadan and alhamdulillah, you're good. But there's a little bit more detail there. We'll talk about when there as well, inshallah. And if a lot of our focus on, on zakatable wealth here, wealth that you know you give zakat on will be uh, assets that are invested so that you have a good understanding of that. I would like to make this interactive. I, I noticed that... Uh, the, the, there's a QA section, which is excellent. I really appreciate you, uh, you all writing your QA, uh, your questions there, and that's an excellent place to write them. But I also would like to maybe have uh, the opportunity, if possible, in the name that people can respond in the in the chat, because I'm going to ask them questions as prompts, and maybe they can just, you know, like write their answers there. That might be a good way. If you can uh, look at that, Brother Nadim, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll yeah, sure. We should be able to uh, set that up. Great, alhamdulillah. We'll start with the story of a wealthy sahabi. Uh, this is Az-Zubair ibn Awam. Az-Zubair ibn Awam, if you don't know, is one of the top 10 sahaba. He is what is called in Arabic, Al-Ashara Al-Mubashirin Bil-Jannah. He is one of the uh, sahaba who was guaranteed paradise while he was alive. There was 10 of them that the Prophet named. There were others as well the Prophet gave uh, you know, that news to, like Bilal radiallahu anhu. But these 10 are considered to be consensus the top 10 Sahaba, of course, the number one being Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, and Ali. And then from five to 10, the ranking is, you know, not so specific, but they're all lumped together as one elite a group of Sahaba. He is one of them. And he was also married to Asma bint Abi Bakr, the daughter of Abu Bakr, Asma. Uh, she's the older sister of Aisha. And uh, so that, and he was also the cousin of the Prophet, uh, you know, a distant cousin of the Prophet. So he was, in every way, uh, you know, the most elite. He is one of the top 10 Sahaba. He is the one who is the uh, brother in law of the Prophet. He's also a cousin of the Prophet. He's one of the uh, earliest Sahabi to accept Islam uh, and con contributed to every cause that he lived through and until uh, the Prophet's life and after the Prophet's life as well. So this is the most elite, right, group of Sahabi. All right, after explaining that to you, why am I bringing that uh, long um, introduction about Zubair and Awam? Because look at what is said, what is said about Zubair. This is uh, uh, this is in Imam al-Dhahabi's book, Thir uh, Alam al-Nubala. Imam al-Dhahabi is the great scholar and historian. He compiled an encyclopedia of the uh, of the greats of the Ummah, of course, starting from Rasulullah all the way down to his time. And then, of course, there's a big piece of it that covers the Sahaba. He talks about Az-Zubair in that encyclopedia. And he says, uh, He says that the inheritance of, uh, of, uh, of Zubair ibn Awam was 40 million, 
Now he doesn't qualify 40 million what, right? 40 million camels, 40 million dinars, 40 million dirhams. He doesn't qualify that. But he says that's what they uh, figured his, his uh, inheritance was. When he died and it was given out to his family and whatnot. Okay. If you were to take the measure of that, this is all dirham, which is silver. It would be that his net worth when he died was, and again, going by this uh, $0.5 per gram uh, amount, this amount could go up and down, of course, but I'm just using that for the sake of convenience. The amount of wealth that he would have as the floor is $59.5 million when he passed away as inheritance, not when he was alive, when he died. Okay, subhanAllah. Uh, and if you were to take the gold measure, the dinar measure, that ends up in the billions, actually. SubhanAllah. So this is a very wealthy Sahabi when he passed away. And not just that he's extremely wealthy, he is the most elite, the top 10 Sahabi. And he is the Prophet's brother-in-law. And, and, and. What that I'm trying to show you uh, with this example, brothers and sisters, is Islam doesn't have a problem with us being wealthy. In fact, the Prophet said that how good is many, money, how good is money, that is in the hand of a righteous person. Allahu Akbar. Because when money is in the hand of the righteous person, what it means is that it's not attached to his heart, right? When the money goes up, the person, you know, they're still happy. When the money goes down, they're still happy. Alhamdulillah. It's not in their heart, it's in their hand. And when the righteous person has money in their hand, what are they doing with it? They're uh, fulfilling their obligations. They're spending on their family. They're spending on the community. They're spending on those who need Everybody stands to win when a good Muslim has money in their hand. And that's the example I wanted to share with you. And that's really, you know, if you want to aspire to be like someone, that's the one you should aspire to be like, you know, amongst the Sahaba or amongst a group of Sahaba. Of course, you can aspire. To, we all aspire to be like Rasulullah. But Rasulullah was very particular about the way he managed his finances because he did not want that to be uh, a source of fitna after him, sallallahu alaihi right? And he was showing what it means to live on absolutely the minimum amount. But while he's living in that way, you also have these great sahaba who really, really were prosperous. And if you want to be, you should, you know, uh, you should try to take these as role models as well, alhamdulillah. And the, of course, the two go together. This is elite spirituality and also elite entrepreneur. Uh, and, 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 and someone who is, uh, you know, in terms of their wealth, their elite in both ways. That's what we want. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Our Lord give us the best in this life and the best in the next life. So it's a really nice example. I, I really like to, uh, I, I like this example of uh, uh, Zubair and Nawam. And I hope you are, uh, you know, inshallah, moved by it. Uh, is investing discouraged? Investing uh, is in saving and investing is it encouraged by our deen, by the by the the text of the Sharia. In fact, it is encouraged, uh, and the evidence for that is a hadith in a Tirmidhi in which the Prophet Ali says, "Alaman waliyatiman lahu malun falyatajid fihi wala yatrukhu hatta la taakulahu sadaqa or hatta taakulahu sadaqa." The Messenger Sallallahu said that the legal guardian of an orphan should invest the orphan's inheritance, lest it is consumed by zakat payments. Look how amazing the foresight is of the messenger here. He says, consider an orphan. An orphan is somebody who is, uh, you know, has, their father has passed away uh, and has left behind, you know, a some sum of wealth, right, as inheritance. Now, the child cannot actually take that money just yet. They're a child. You have to wait until they reach the age of bulu, until they reach the age of maturity, when they become an adult, and then the money is given to them so they can utilize it. But if that period of time, say it's 10 years, and if that money is just sitting there, every year, 2.5% of it, it's getting reduced by zakat. You see, by the time the child gets that money, 25% of it is already gone. SubhanAllah. This is considered to be irresponsible. That's what the Prophet is trying to get at, that a person who acts in this irresponsible way uh, is not really doing the job of the wali. The wali is the protector. They're the one who protects and safeguards and ensures that the interests of the person they're protecting are taken care of. And in, the, in that spirit, the wali needs to 
invest فليتجر فيه يتجر we see that word from tijara and that's where we get the idea of investing so that it can grow to a point where at least the zakat payments are covered until the child will get their inheritance so this is the beautiful hadith uh, that shows to us the uh, you know the 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 responsibility of saving and investing wisely so that we can leave behind you know for our kids and you know for those who are dependent upon us inshallah ta'ala and then also just the world view of how we see uh, wealth in the bigger picture we see it as something that we uh, work for but we we see it as something that we save and grow but it's we don't see it as something that determines our worth we don't see it as something that determines our mood right we see it as something that allah has given us and then we take care of it just like anything that allah gives us that we take care of and that we're liable for so that is uh, the view of zakat excuse me the view of wealth inshallah ta'ala uh, the next thing is why I give zakat this is a briefer the discussion because alhamdulillah you are all you know if i ask you why you give zakat you would say number one is the pillar of islam okay but it is also something and i want you to be intentional about this when you give your zakat when you donate whether it is online whether it is in person whichever way it is that you donate when you donate i want you to remember this hadith of the prophet sallallahu he says sallallahu that uh Every single person, on the day of judgment, every person will be in the shade of their charity until Allah judges between the people. Subhanallah. On that day, the shade is the most premium thing. That's why you have the hadith of the seven that Allah has shaded on the day of judgment. Because on that day, it is going to be unbearably hot. And there is no shade anywhere except the shade that Allah provides. And one of the shades that Allah provides to the righteous, and then all of the, for everyone who was shaded on that day, they are shaded by virtue of something good that they did. Whether they were of someone growing up in the worship of Allah, or their heart was attached to the mosque, and so on and so forth. And the one of the virtues that allows the person to attain shade on the day where there is no shade, that's unbearably hot, relief on the day where there is no relief, is your zakat. Allahu Akbar. Right? So when you give your zakat, and you give your sadaqah, remember, inshallah, brothers and sisters, that you are building for yourself. On that day, when there is no shade, you are building for yourself a shade. On the day when there is no relief, you are building for yourself relief. That is what you do. it. And if you give in that, with that mindset, you, you not only will you feel happy, but you would, you know, be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to contribute, alhamdulillah, to uh, these uh, excellent causes that we see all around us. Purification increase. Zakat in its by its uh, its etymology, its trans is its etymology is a numu wa ziyada. It is something that grows. Subhanallah. Means what this means is that when you give your zakat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause your wealth to grow, will have um, this extra barakah. There will be uh, wealth that will come your way. And, uh, you know, the contentment of what you have will increase and you will feel that this wealth that you have, it's, it's, you know, the most important thing is to feel content with what you have. And that is what zakat brings. But on top of that, like the messenger said, like the Quran says, that whatever you have spent in the way of Allah, Allah will give that back to you. You will not be shortchanged. Ma naqasa malun. When you give, your money does not decrease. Allah will replace that in one way, shape, or form. So we know this is an increase and we believe that. And when you give sadaqah, we should be mindful of that. Also, it is a uh, purification. Zakat literally comes from the word uh, zakka, which means to purify something. So we are purifying the wealth that we hold on to by giving away this wealth that is zakat. So when you give your zakat, inshallah ta'ala, please be mindful that this is your building, your shade on the Day of Judgment. And you're purifying your wealth that you have. And you're increasing your wealth that you have. Alhamdulillah. Okay, now let's get into what is zakat. Yes, you see, this is the next item here. Uh, what is zakat? And specifically, wealth that is zakatable. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some uh, things here. I'm going to give you a definition. 
and then we'll do like a quick um, you know, in, interactive thing here just to get you involved. Uh, a definition is as follows, okay? That this is the book uh, definition of zakat. Um, it is the obligatory charity, right? Haqqun wajib, fi malin khas. It is obligatory charity that is the right of the poor and needy recipients. Let me just bring out this pointer here, laser pointer. Ah, there we go. It is the right of the poor needy recipients. Do you notice that? This is how we see zakat, brothers and sisters. This is so different than anybody else who gives charity who are not a believer. It's great that they give charity. And we make dua that Allah blesses them with the guidance of Islam. And may Allah, you know, increase them in blessing and whatnot. But the way we see it is totally unique. We see it as the right of the poor. Meaning, when it's time to give zakat, the money that is in my bank account that is now zakat is due on, the portion of it that's zakat, right? Say I have $1,000, just for the example, and $25 now is zakat. That $25, the way we see it, is now the right of the poor. I must fulfill that right and get it to the poor. It's no longer mine. It's theirs now. If I hold on to it, I'm depriving them of their right. That's how we see zakat. Subhanallah. Right? This is so transformative. Uh, the, the, the way we see wealth and our place in, uh, in the world and it comes to transacting money between peoples really is unique. And alhamdulillah, we need to appreciate that. It is due only upon specific types of wealth. This is important. It's not due on everything. Not everything that's valuable will you pay zakat on. In fact, it's a reductive list. Only a small number of things. It is due only upon specific types of wealth which have been retained for one lunar year. This is the other thing. It's something that is saved. It is not income. You can earn a lot and then spend everything. And then if that's the case and you don't have anything left behind, you don't pay zakat. That is totally fine. Zakat is on what has been retained for one lunar year. In Arabic, what they say is مُضِيُّ الْحَوْلِ أو as the Prophet said, لا زَكَاتَ فِي مَالٍ حَتَّى يَحُولَ عَلَيْهِ الْحَوْلِ There is no zakat given on wealth until the year has passed on it. Meaning you've retained it. For one lunar year. It is only it is due only upon the well to do, right? You have to have a basic amount of money, that basic threshold you must have, and you must clear it throughout the year, and then and only then you give zakat. So this is a, 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 a pretty involved definition, but I wanted to give you some glimpses of things, and then we'll begin to talk about uh, other items here, uh, examples uh, or, or specifically how, how do we define zakatable wealth? Like how do we talk about Wealth that you give zakat on. Okay, few things that have to be there in place for zakatable wealth, as you can uh, extrapolate from the uh, definition. Number one is you have to have complete ownership. Wealth that is owned and is accessible. If you don't own it, of course you don't give zakat on it. Uh, an example of that would be a loan. If you have if you borrowed money, that's not really your money. You have to give it back. So zakat on that is not to be paid. Okay, but we'll discuss more specifics later on. Accessible wealth. Wealth that is accessible, you can go and get it at any time. You pay zakat on that. If you can't access your wealth, if it's locked away in some account, okay, you don't pay zakat on it until you get access to it. Okay, and this is the details we will discuss, of course, uh, down the road. It is only due upon the well-to-do. Remember the well-to-do part? Who, who is well-to-do? How do you define well-to-do? This is how we define well-to-do. And this is an important term when it comes to zakat. Nisab. Yes, nisab. This is actually a very important a term that de denotes the threshold that must be met for a person to give zakat. Okay? Now, there's a long story. I usually tell this in like a longer webinar in person about why we have two nisab values. Okay? I'll give you the TLDR version of it. <laughs> okay? We have in Islam... Back in the day, many different types of assets. Uh, you would have camels, you would have cows, you would have farmland, crops, you would have gold and silver. Each of these assets would have a different nisab. So if, for example, if you had 25 camels, then you would give zakat. If you didn't have 25 camels, you don't give zakat, okay? That's how it used to be, all right? 
Now, today, we don't actually do this. We don't, you know, unless, mashallah, you have camels and whatnot, you can ask me afterwards, how much is your zakat? All right, but I, I, I don't think you have camels that you have to pay zakat on. The way we do it today is we uh, find out our net worth, our value, and we sum it up or amalgamate it in a dollar figure. Yes, that's how we do it, right? Your, your net worth is calculated. Uh, all your assets are like, you know, um, co combined into one figure. Uh, so that's the way things work today. That's how, you know, the different asset classes and each of them having a different nasab was back then, okay? This is the reason why you have two competing nisab values. Uh, you, you will probably hear this in every Zakat workshop that you go to. This of gold, this of silver, right? This is why. Now, what's the simplified way to move forward? Uh, we take the nisab of gold, okay? The nisab of gold is about 6,640 Kenyan dollars. You can check the specific amount because this amount this specifically changes every day, right? But it's 85 grams of gold, right? If you have 85 grams worth of gold in your possession for the whole year, then you pay zakat. Okay, let me repeat that. If you have 85 grams of gold, which is $6,640 Canadian, okay? And you've had that money with you for the whole year, never dipping below it, then you pay zakat. If you've dipped below it, even momentarily, you don't pay zakat the whole year. You see, that is how it works. The moment you dip below it, your zakat for that year is not due. Your zakat clock restarts, okay? If you wanted to pay it, it's up to you. Alhamdulillah, no one's stopping you. It'll be sadaqah, it'll be accepted as a charity uh, from your uh, on your end, but it is not an obligation. Hatta yahula alayhi al until the year has passed and uh, the milk al nisab it is the uh, the amount uh, that is the minimum threshold has been attained. The silver nisab is too low, right? Six hundred dollars is not a value of a person who's well to do, right? In fact, you would probably say someone who's six hundred dollars has six hundred dollars at the end of the year doesn't have much, yes. Um, so we don't really. I don't think it's a it's an accurate value anymore. The more accurate value of being well to do is the the eighty five grams of gold or sixty six hundred forty dollars. Canadian. Okay, so that is the minimum. Again, complete ownership. You must have the the wealth, and you must own it. And number two, your wealth must remain above that bare minimum threshold. Possession for the wealthy year. We spoke about this. It has to remain above that threshold throughout the Hijri year. Okay, and this uh, is is when it's that's when it's uh, an obligation. Again, you're always free to pay. When uh, you know, if you have lesser, no one's stopping you, but I'm just talking about when it is an obligation free from haram income. Okay, this does not mean that you just say, Oh, you know what, haram income, I don't pay zakat on, so let me just earn haram income. <laughs> That's exactly the opposite. What we're saying is, you should not have haram income, you should remove all haram income from your life, you should try to pivot away from it as smoothly and as uh, swiftly as you can and move to halal income. There is an immense, immense barakah in your life. You will notice when you do this. You can, you know, you can take this to the bank without no, no, no pun intended. That if a person leaves haram wealth and they uh, focus their attention on earning wealth through means that are compliant in the Sharia, the amount of blessings that you enjoy in life they just multiply. Okay, so that is what this intended slide is saying, that if you do have haram wealth, someone is earning money from fixed income uh, assets like a bond, right? Not Islamic bond, but a conventional bond. That is a impermissible means because you're money, earning money from a debt instrument. So that should not be factored into your wealth. You should actually take all those returns and just give them away uh, and seek Allah's forgiveness. Okay. So that is the concept of Zakatable wealth. Now, let's get into some fun things. All right, folks, I want you to type something in the chat. Can I just have some people type something in the chat, like hello or salam alaikum or something? I want to see what the chat is like. Where is the chat? There it is. All right, thank you. Barakallah Fiko. Okay. Uh, is this Sister Nadia from Al Huda and the, the one who I did Arabic class with? Yes. Allahu Akbar. Look at that. Uh, Dr. Ali from London. I see you people. 
<laughs> All right, very good. Uh, so let's uh, let's get going. Uh, is the cat due on? You tell me yes or no. All right. Is the cat due on cash? Yes, it's cash, right? Cash money. You have to give zakat on it. Uh, oh, is that Rafi? Rafi, my friend from high school. Allah Akbar. What? Look at this, huh? Mm, mashallah. Good, good, uh, good company to have today. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. Very welcome you all. Thank you for being here. So nice to see familiar names. Gold. So here, gold is gold bullion that's stored in the bank as an investment. You put it away in the bank as an investment. Gold bullion. All of us say yes. The correct answer is yes. Very good. Zakat is definitely due on that. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Uh, your house that you live in, is zakat due on it? Everybody is saying no. It seems that consensus no. That is excellent, mashallah. If you own a house, mashallah, good for you. <laughs> you are a, a rare one. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, but alhamdulillah, the, uh, if you own the house that you live in, you do not pay zakat on it. It is your house. It is not considered to be a zakatable asset. Okay. What about a car? Do you own, do you give zakat on cars? The correct answer is no, you do not give zakat on cars. Cars that you know, again, this is cars that are used, your, this is your personal usage car, right? That you, you know, it's for your own usage. You do not pay zakat on it. If you are a car dealer, right? Like car dealership, you own cars and that's a business asset for you. That's a different conversation. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about personal usage here. Okay. It's interesting. Did you know that uh, Uber driver, <laughs> uh, the, you know, like there's zakat due on camels and, uh, and cattle, like, you know, cows and sheep, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but there's no zakat on horses. Mm -hmm. That's why, that's where the precedence comes for these things, right? Like these things that we say, oh, what's the, how can you say that? That's actually where the precedence uh, for it lies, okay? And also because zakat is a reductive thing, it's only described on like, here is the items and everything else is excluded, right? That's also the way uh, we look at it, okay? Next up is, okay, now this is an image of, if I can just get it to load, Allahu Akbar, there, uh, of a bakery, okay? Imagine you own a bakery, that's what your business is. Is there zakat due on the oven of that bakery? A fixed asset. Say, the profits of the bakery, you would say yes, right? But what about like a fixed asset, like the oven? or like the floor or the lighting? Mm, people are saying no, that is very good. Excellent. What about in the same bakery, the raw materials, like the flour and the butter and whatever else is needed to make pizza, right? What about that? The, the ingredients that you are using to manufacture your product that you make your money from? Hmm. The answer to that is actually yes, okay? Because, ah, you are using it. Ah, this is important. This is the one that we have to uh, talk about, okay? Keep this example in mind. I'm gonna bring this example up in a little bit, okay? But that the bakery here uh, is, 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 a, is a metaphor I'm gonna use to, uh, to describe how we look at stocks. But the ingredients specifically here that are used to make the bread or the pizza, are like the bread or pizza that you're selling to earn money from. So that is where zakat is due. But the oven, it's a fixed asset. There's no zakat due on that. Okay, let's talk about what zakat is paid on. Remember I said it's a reductive list. So it's four main categories of wealth, okay? Number one, cattle, livestock. And it depends on the animal type. And again, mashallah, if you have livestock, you can ask me and I can look it up in the book and tell you what the answer is. <laughs> Uh, number two is crop yield. Crop yield is if you're a farmer and you you know you farm your crops. The day you farm your crop, uh, you give zakat. Like the Quran says, give its right the day you harvest it. Okay, and it's five percent 
if you are irrigating it yourself and 10% if it is naturally irrigated. See, this is fair, right? Naturally irrigated, you don't have to do anything. You just, you just sit there and chill and your crops grow. Alhamdulillah. All you have to do is harvest them. Okay? So you pay a little bit more. But if you're investing money or spending money, there's a cost for you to grow your crops that is high, then your amount that you pay is lower. Hmm? All right. Uh, cash, gold, and silver. This is the one that applies to us. This is what, uh, whatever we do, this is the amount that we pay, 2.5%. The Prophet said that it is one dinar from every 40, right? One over 40, that fraction is how much? 2.5. If you don't have to do it in your head, it's okay. 2.5%. That's where we get that figure from. One out of 40, all right? And uh, business commodities. Business commodities are products sold to make money. Hmm? Now, you can break this down broadly into two types of assets, business commodities. Current assets, also known as short-term assets, they are considered to be liquid and subject to zakat at the full 2.5%. Fixed assets, also known as long-term assets, are considered illiquid and thus they are exempt from zakat. So let's go back to our analogy of the uh, of the bakery. Yes, you own the bakery. Say you own a bakery. You will not have to pay zakat on the equipment in the store. For example, the oven. That is a fixed asset. Right? That is illiquid. But you will pay zakat on the profits from the bakery and the ingredients you use to make your bread or whatever you're making and you sell that. All of that is considered to be liquid. That, the ingredients, the product, that is what you pay zakat on and the profits from it, whatever has been saved, okay? Now, of course, the bakery example is not like, I'm just trying to make it simplified, right? Of course, you don't, you're don't. you not gonna have bread for like a year. <laughs> if you do, may Allah help your customers. Uh, uh, and flour, et cetera, as well. You're not gonna have that kind of stale um, stuff sitting around. you probably like, you know, flushing it out every few days and whatnot, right? But in the example of the bakery, it is just the profits that have been retained for a year. But the same idea is applied to businesses, particularly publicly traded companies when it comes to stocks. How much of that company's value do we raise a cat on? What we will say is, well, let's dis distinguish between the current assets and fixed assets. And once we have that distinction, we only pay a percentage of that current company's value we pay zakat on, and alhamdulillah, that would be like paying zakat on the profits from the bakery. We'll get to this more down the road, but I hope this example is tracking the idea of the differentiation between something that's liquid versus liquid in a business. Okay, uh, zakat is not paid on, right? And those are the only things that you pay it on, that everything else is not paid on, but these are some examples of what zakat is not paid on. Loans payable, okay? Money that you owe to somebody. Remember, the first condition is that you have complete ownership. It's not your money. You don't pay zakat on it. Okay? Now, uh, if a person is like, oh, I have a mortgage of a million dollars. So that means I don't pay zakat for the rest of my life. No, brother. That's not true. Okay? Uh, so if you have a long-term uh, loan, then what we will do is we will estimate how much of that loan is a year's worth. Okay? Just to be fair. Right? If you can say, I am paying $1,000 in principle every single month of my long-term loan, then we would say 1,000 times 12, 12,000 is the money that you don't have, right? That's like the loan that's payable for the year. That's the one that from your whole, uh, when you combine all your assets, you can say that's the money I don't have and I can exclude that from my zakat payment, okay? That is when it comes to loan payable. The example of it, if you were to take the example, say someone has $20,000 that they've saved for a year. Yes, 20. How much is Zakat on 20,000? Let's see if someone can get it. 2.5%. People are frantically calculating. Someone type the answer, please. There is no answer yet. 500, Brother Nadeem, you are the winner, mashallah. <laughs> and Sister Nadia, thank you very much. Uh, so if you look at uh, the, the money that um, $20,000, right? Uh, the zakat on it is very small, $500. Now, if 
the person in this, is in the situation that I just described. They have a thousand dollars a month they pay in principle, not the interest. And again, we don't condone that kind of contract, but I'm just giving it as a real example. Okay, uh, the a thousand dollars a month they're paying. A thousand times twelve is twelve thousand. Yes, twenty thousand minus twelve is gives us what? Eight thousand. What is the zakat of eight thousand? The zakat on eight thousand is um, it's just two hundred dollars, right? So the amount that they have twenty thousand, you would say twelve thousand of it they don't really own because they're committed to paying it back. So the eight that remains with them for the whole year, it's above the nisab of six thousand six hundred. Then its zakat is two point five percent, which is about two hundred dollars. I hope that example is tracking. Okay, brief examples. Want to give this? I, I, we won't spend too much time on loans. That's why I wanted to give an example right away. Res residential or investment property. You do not give zakat on residential or investment property. Neither, in fact, you live in it. No zakat. You bought it as an investment. No zakat. The money you earn from it. If the money you earn from it, you save it. You pay zakat on it. If you don't save that money, you spent it. There's no zakat on it uh, either. Okay. Inaccessible wealth. Wealth that is, you don't have access to pensions. You don't have access to it. You can't walk into like CPPs, you know, government of Canada is like, give me my CPP. They won't give it to you. Okay. You have to get to a certain age. Even though the money was taken from your paycheck, you don't have access to it. So that is inaccessible. No zakat on it. Okay. In fact, pension remains inaccessible throughout. They only give you like a monthly little payment, right? So in reality, you never really have access to it. Locked in retirement accounts. Uh, these are things that uh, some people have. Um, until you get access to it, you have no zakat that's due on it. It's inaccessible. Okay. And of course, also in that category is other things that are precious, like precious metals, cars. There's no zakat on that. Uh, even though they're valuable, you know, there's no zakat that is paid on it. Okay. Now, let's look at the, the the meat and potatoes of our discussion today, right? Not to make you hungry. <laughs> I was thinking of that now. <laughs> but the, the the core of our discussion here is investments. Yes? Should we pay zakat on investments? What do you think? Should we? The stocks you own? People are saying, everybody's saying yes. The answer is yes, you should, right? Because the investments are analogous to either cash, gold, or silver, right? Remember there was a four categories. The two that applies to us, business commodities and cash, gold, and silver. Zakat is analogous to either of them, okay? That's how an investment is. You could say my stock is like cash. I can sell it right away. It's liquid. I can... Withdraw that money, it will be in my account. I can take it out and I will have it in my hand. Yes? So it's like cash. Great. That's an excellent way of looking at it. Or you could also say my stock is like a business that I bought. It's not the bakery. I have I don't own the whole bakery, but I own part of the bakery. Right? And the bakery is selling products that when they make a profit, they share that profit with me, either through dividends or by the price of that share going up one of these two ways so in that way it's a business commodity both ways are good now it depends on how you look at it right it goes back to what is your intention how you look at it if you view it as cash gold and silver you will calculate the stock as if it's cash gold and silver if you look at it as a business commodity you will look at it as if like that bakery right you exclude the uh, the oven you exclude the fixed assets, but you include the short-term, the uh, liquid asset, right? Let's come to that uh, more specifically, okay? Let's take the example. Uh, let, let's apply the two things, and I'll ask, like, I'll, I'll um, break this down for you, inshallah. If you did not voluntarily con contribute your investments and cannot access the investments, that money is not zakatable, you see? You did not contribute it voluntarily. It was taken from you. And you cannot access it. You, you have no access to it. This money is not zakatable. What is an example of this? An example of this would be 
your CPP, right? You exactly. Thank you very much, Brother Sama uh, and Stanadia. It is that you. It's taken from your uh, paycheck. You have no say in it, and you can access it. No account. Okay. If you voluntarily vol voluntarily contributed to it, and you can fully access the investment then the entire amount is zakatable. Yes, an example of this would be the TFSA account, right? The TFSA account is voluntarily, you have to put money in it yourself, okay? And once you have put money in it, you have full access to it. So the entirety of it is there for you to access and thus it is the entire amount is zakatable, okay? We're coming, we're coming to it. <laughs> uh, if you voluntarily contribute it and can access the investments partially, the portion that can be collected after subtracting taxes and penalties is zakatable. What is this referring to? Someone tell me. What am I getting at with this example? Allahu Akbar. But Osama, are you... Uh, the same but Osama from the Arabic class as well. <laughs> Allah, look at this. All the alhamdulillah, good times. Alhamdulillah. This is in fact the self-directed RSP. That's the intended uh, account here. You voluntarily contributed to it. Self-directed, you put it in yourself because you want that tax break. Yes? Oh wait. But you can access the investment partially. Because if you were to access it fully, the government will come and take take your money. <laughs> they will take taxes from you. Yes or no? But in the name, they'll take up to 30% withholding tax. You know, there's like a whole uh, table there. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So because the investment is partially accessible, and by the way, there's downstream effects. If you take it all out, for example, RSP, you will pay taxes now and then it will affect your child tax benefit. And there's like a bunch of effects of it that is because of this tax system we live in. The point is it's partially accessible and has effects on your, on your uh, financial picture. The portion that can be collected after subtracting taxes and penalty is accountable, all right? So for the RRSP account, especially the self-directed one, you look at here is the value of the portfolio and I can get 70% of that out of it if I, if I was to try to withdraw it, okay? Then that 70% is what you will pay zakat on, all right? We'll get to group RSP in a second. Just wait a minute, please, okay? If you voluntarily contributed and cannot access the investment, it's zakatable the day you can access the wealth, okay? This is what I'm referring to here. I'm just gonna actually just do something quickly. I have a candle going when you can start. What I'm referring to here is your, uh, say, your group RSP. You put uh, your, your company matches your contributions to your uh, RSP. Right? You put in like a certain amount, they match it, and that goes into like a group RSP. Great. You can't really access it until you have left that company or a certain time period has passed, depending on the situation. Okay. And you keep contributing, you keep contributing, the money keeps growing, keeps growing, mashallah, hopefully, inshallah, <laughs> right? Who knows in this market, right? But inshallah, it's growing. But that money, you can't access it until, say, you leave the company or you get to a certain point in, uh, in, in your life. Then in that case, it is not zakatable until you can access it. The day you access it, you take the value of the entire amount that you can access and pay zakat on it once, okay? Let's take the group RSP example. Someone's contributing $10,000 a year, mashallah, maybe that's a lot, <laughs> but say $10,000 a year to the group RSP and the company, mashallah, very generously matches it dollar for dollar. $20,000 are going in their group RSP. Hopefully they're putting it all in SPUS, huh, brother Nadeem? <laughs> so that 20K, say they do that for 10 years. That's 200K that's there. And inshallah, there's more growth in that too. And then 10 years later, they leave the company and other companies like, here's your group RSP, all right? 
Now, the day they leave the company and that group RSP is transferred to like, uh, like a you know, self-directed account or some other account where they do have access to it immediately, now they would pay zakat of the 200K once and off they go. Okay, this is called damar in Arabic. Okay, the precedence for that comes from the idea of damar, which is uh, the wealth that you have, but you know you can't get. Examples of it is like buried under the sand somewhere. You can't find it, and then you find it. The day you find it, you take it and you give zakat on it. Okay, or money that was you know held by a uh, unjust ruler that used to happen. Like you would come to a city with like your trade goods, and the ruler would take your money. And then they're just keeping it and they're just keeping it. So until you can get the money, you don't pay zakat on it. From that same idea, we uh, extrapolate this uh, particular part. We'll get to RSP at the very end. Just please hold your uh, questions to that uh, till then. Okay. This is in compliance with the International Islamic Thick uh, Academy, their, uh, pu their um, publication uh, and their paper on that, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So this is the basic framework that we're working with when it comes to investment accounts we look at how did you contribute to it and do you have access to it okay um that is how we look at it brother muhammad just to follow up on that that one example where that money was inaccessible to you for say 10 years the day you get it right you pay it on that that day and then every year forward as well right? It's assuming that you have not cashed it out, you've not used it up, right? Every year forward as well, you pay, but you pay it only once. You don't pay retroactively for 10 years. As I hope that point is clear, inshallah. Great. Next slide. A note on zakat and money, okay? So this, we're having this discussion, seems complicated. You're like, oh, my brain is already fasting and it's all mushy now because you're talking about all these things, terminologies. It's because the nature of money and investments evolve over time, right? This is how uh, it is uh, the case. Um, so as, it, you, know, you know, like zakatul mal sits at the intersection of what's called ibadat and mu'amalat, right? Ibadat are ritual worship, worships. Mu'amalat are transactions that you do. There is a lot of rules about ritual worships and mu'amalat, there's some basic guidelines, okay? And zakat al-mal is right at the intersection because your mal is from the transactions part and the zakat is from the ibadat part, you see? It's a very interesting, uh, you know, discussion in usul al-fiqh, right? But because of the nature of money, investment instruments evolve over time, because of that, how we calculate zakat, also evolves over time as well. And that's why these discussions happen. And that's why there is, you know, some, uh, you know, th 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 this is like a forum, right? This, I'm giving you some, like some tools for your toolkit. And then how you use them, it's up to you. You can take the hammer approach, right? Just like hammer the nail in. Simplest option. That's the easiest approach. You take everything that you own, all your investments, it doesn't matter if you can access it or not, 2.5% of it, and you pay that as zakat. Allahu Akbar. That will result in you paying a greater amount of zakat than is due. But if you do that, then it's safer. It's just like, alhamdulillah, I have nothing to worry about. And in fact, that is mimbab al-ihsan. It is from the, uh, from the, cat, the characteristics of someone who does uh, who lives with excellence. This is actually the case with a man who came to the Prophet ﷺ and he had a camel, right, that he had to give it a zakat. Because if you have 25 camels, you would have to give one camel. But even the camels are very different specifics. When there's a camel who gives milk, the camel who doesn't give milk, and they each have their specific rulings. I don't know them off the top of my head right now, actually. But this man's zakat was a camel that had no milk, okay? That's what he had to give. That was what was due. But when he went to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, this is not a very good camel. You can't really use it for anything. I will give you a camel that instead of this, I will give you a better camel. Okay, The one that gives milk, that is younger, that can get pregnant and make, you know, can give birth to more camels. I'll give you one like that instead. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted that and was happy with that. Uh, this person did ihsan. They paid more than what they were uh, what the zakat was due, right? So this simplest option has precedence. It is good. It is easy. 
inshallah there's barakah in it but uh, you keep in mind this is a very you're you're going to pay much more zakat than is due on your money okay now there's also the calculated option right and, and, and just the, if they use the example the analogy of the toolbox this is the hammer right just you hammer a nail in and off you go uh, the other uh, analogy is like you have more specifics more refined you're using a whole set of tools okay let's look at that refined calculated option as well all right what about stock on that bakery uh, exa example aha i'm happy that you asked that question brother muhammad rahman because we're getting to that right i spoke firstly about the account types remember the account types are the vehicles for your investments now we'll talk about the investments that will go inside your account types okay stocks etfs mutual funds gold silver etc cetera, etc cetera. okay now we'll talk about the actual stuff that goes inside okay very good stocks what does a stock resemble most closely is it cash or is it a business commodity what do you all think you can see say cash or bc for business commodity what does it resemble most closely in your opinion I'll give people a minute to type out their answers. Uh, we, we, the answers are both depending the term you hold. Allah Akbar, Sayyidina Nasir Ahmed, this is a very interesting answer. Uh, most answers that I'm seeing right now are saying business commodity. Yes? Uh, we'll get to that, Brother uh, Hashim, inshallah. Uh, both answers that we're seeing. Uh, sorry, the, the answer is the majority I'm saying uh, is uh, business commodity. The correct answer is it really is up to you. It's how you see it. And as Brother Nasser uh, alluded to here, it could depend on how long you hold it. But at the end of the day, it's how you see it. Okay? If you see your stocks as cash, then you treat them as cash. If you see your stocks and your investments as Business commodities. It's like the bakery. I part, bought a piece of the bakery at the uh, a piece of the bakery, mm -hmm. and I want the the the, the uh, shares of the profits. Then it's a business commodity. Okay, let's talk about it. If it was, if you view your stocks, your holdings as cash, this is the simplest way to calculate zakat on financial investments. Okay, you take the market value of the assets. Okay, so maybe you bought it at a high price and now it's low. You're a miskin like me. Okay, <laughs> maybe you buy, bought it at a low price and it's high. Allahu Akbar, you're doing great. Whatever is the market value of the assets, you take that and uh, you know you assume that the entire portfolio is to be liquidated at once. That's how you assume. That's how when you're working with it as cash, that's how you go about it. Okay. And then given that the company shares, and these are publicly traded companies, right? So their shares are largely liquid, can be converted to cash at any times. Uh, this is how some scholars, uh, they, this is the fatwas you find from most scholars, right? They'll say, I just treat it as cash. Okay? But I would say to you, there's, there's both options. It's, it depends on how you see it. If you were to view it as, as cash, here's an example of how you would calculate, uh, if I can just get this going. Yes, uh, here is a, a Suncor, Canadian company, right? Oil and gas. I, I think they're still Sharia compliant. I'm not sure though. Uh, the stock price when I had made the slide was 31.76. Okay, so we'll just go with that. Okay, you have own a thousand shares of Suncor. The total current value is 31,760. Yes, what is the zakat on it? What's the percentage, brothers and sisters? I'm treating it like cash. Two point five percent. Excellent. Two point five percent of thirty one thousand seven sixty is seven hundred and ninety four dollars. Okay, you will give that as a cut. That's on that holding of Suncor. Okay, you view it as cash, and again, the investment account is determining how much you have access to. If this is in a TFSA, you have access to all thousand, 
of the shares. All 31,760, yes? If this is in a self-directed RSP, you will have access to 70% uh, of that, minus the withholding tax, you see? So you take that. That is a separate conversation, the investment account. Right now, I'm just talking about the stock itself, okay? And then we'll come back and put the two together. But I just, just for the sake of humoring the question that was asked there, uh, this is why we're trying to get to the point of the investment account and the investment itself. The investment itself, if you look at it as cash, that's how you calculate it. Purely as if you liquidated, assuming to liquidate it at its current market value, and that's the amount that you would pay, okay? This is uh, option number one. Option number two is business commodity, the bakery. Now you see your stock as owning a piece of the bakery. That's really what stocks are, right? You're owning uh, a share in a corporation. Yes, uh, you're entitled to their profits. That's what you are as a shareholder. Current assets known as short-term assets and fixed assets are known as long-term assets. You pay zakat only on the percentage of your investment that is comprised of current assets. You can find this out uh, through a basic formula that I'll share with you, okay? Uh, fixed assets are those acquired to produce revenue in the future rather than being sold uh, in the short term to generate income. So they're excluded from zakat. The fixed assets are the oven, the flooring, the lights, the signage of the bakery, right? You don't sell that stuff to make profit. You buy that stuff so you can run your bakery. The uh, current assets are the ones that are used to make money, right? Uh, that could be the ingredients. That could be the product, right? You pay that on the percentage of zakat, uh, on the percentage, excuse me, of how much of that is uh, a portion of the whole bakery. And how do we arrive at that for a stock price for a uh, publicly traded company? Uh, this is a, a tedious example or a tedious way to do it, but it's very accurate, okay? The way we arrive at it is with the following formula. You take the zakat uh, asset ratio or zakatable asset ratio and multiply that with the current value of your holdings in dollars. What is the zakatable asset ratio? It is the total current assets. You can look this up in the financials of a publicly traded company. Divide by their market cap. That tells you what percentage of the company is zakatable, okay? Meaning how much of this company is the bread and the flour and the dough and how much of it is the oven, the signage, the floor, the lights. That's what this ratio is telling us, okay? And as I mentioned in the previous slide, this is a bit more uh, of a, a, a wise approach if you are long on a stock. You want to hold this for a while, right? Then you should probably view it as a business commodity. Let's look at the example of Suncor again, right? The price of Suncor again, 31.76. You own a thousand shares. The value of your holding is 31,760. All right, same as the one before, yes? Uh, Suncor's total current assets are 10.977 billion, okay? And their market cap is 57.9 billion. This is when I made the slides. Maybe it's up uh, or maybe it's down now, who knows, okay? The ratio, is 10.977 divided by 57.9 billion, yes? That is the ratio. That is the ratio or that's the portion of the sun core that is the bread, the flour, the dough, et cetera, all right? For the purposes of illustration here, 10.977 divided by 57.9, that is about 18.9%, say about 20%. So 20% of Suncor is the bread, the flour, and the dough, and 80% of it is the oven, the lights, the floor, okay? That's how we arrive at this conclusion. And once you've done that, you multiply that to the value of the total holding, and then you arrive at the final answer, 2.5%, $150. Do you remember how much the other one was? The other one was 794 if you treat it as cash. Huh? And this one is 150. It is 20% of this. Yes. So 
if you view your stock as a business commodity, this is how you should calculate it. Okay. If you view it as cash, you just take its market value, assume you're going to liquidate it, and 2.5% of it is what you pay the Okay. That's the two ways that you can navigate. It can go by your intention. I am doing day trading versus I'm holding it for as a long term investment, right? It's up to you, right? Uh, not to you know take a position on day trading or whatnot. I'm just giving you as an example, right? Or someone who's trading it on very short term, they buy it and they quickly sell it, whatnot. Maybe you're trading it as cash. It could be up to you. It, sorry, it could be how long you hold it. At the end of the day, it's how you see it. Okay, it's your call. It is your wealth and your zakat, and you have to answer to Allah, right? Uh, my recommendation, if you ask me, is you follow the uh, business commodity route for when it comes to stocks. Even though it's a bit more work, it is precise and it is accurate. And I believe this is the intention of most people, just my, my, my personal opinion, when they purchase stocks, this is the intention of, the, of most people. But that's just my personal recommendation. I'm sharing both options with you. You pick whatever makes sense to you, okay? Uh, and yes, it's about 18.95% as I shared before. Uh, ETFs and mutual funds. What is an ETF or an, an, a mutual fund? Uh, you know, mutual funds are a collection of stocks. ETFs is a, you know, tracks an index. That's also basically a collection of stocks. And it is difficult to do that for each underlying security. You are going to spend many hours then. <laughs> you know, uh, and our SPUS has like 230 names in it. Allahu Akbar, good luck with the finding up all that, all those information, right? Uh, treating as cash might be the simplest way indeed, okay? Uh, but there is a ballpark figure, right? The ballpark park figure for current assets is about 30%. This is according to Sheikh Hatim al-Hajj. In fact, my friend did the calculation for SPUS and uh, HLAL, right? Like the two of the more uh, prominent uh, ETFs out in the market that are share compliant. And the Zakatable ratio is closer to 15%, actually, right? Uh, than 30%. So if you're taking 30%, that is a very safe way. Let's take an example just to make things, uh, you know, bring them together. Say you have SPUS, the price of it is $30. That's when I made the slides. I think now it's about 28 or something or 29. Uh, you own a thousand shares, right? Uh, oh, mashallah, clients of SP had a product that averages the capital ratio on their portfolio. Allahu Akbar, that is excellent. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so you take this and you then multiply your, the value of your holding is 30,100. Allahu Akbar. Uh, you treat it as cash, it will be 2.5%, $752. Yes? If you treat it as a business commodity and you take that 30% ballpark figure, which is in reality overpaying still. Pretty safe, but 30% is a very, very, very safe amount. You take that, it comes out to $225.75. Yes. So that is the easy way. And of course, Mashallah Nadim mentioned that the clients at SP Canada they get the average accountable ratio on their portfolios. So now you can be very confident in exactly how much zakat you have to pay for your holdings, your stocks, your ETFs that you are treating as a business commodity. That's an excellent value at Hamdi. That is uh, ETFs, bonds, and I'm talking about conventional bonds here. Uh, they are, um, they, they have, uh, they are interest-bearing commodities. It is not permissible Islamically to hold those as investments. And we don't consider it to be legitimate wealth that is paid zakat on. Of course, there is Islamic bonds as well, Sukuk and whatnot. I don't know if we have any of them here, but I don't think they're as popular. Um, but, but specifically conventional bonds, we would exclude them and whatnot. Uh, property, as we spoke about it before, this house you reside in is not subject to zakat. Yes, this is important because you live in it. Okay. Uh, rental property, same idea. The value of the property, there is no zakat on it. The rental income, Minus expenses is whatever you saved, right? The, the, the income of the rent is it's not like a monthly zakat you pay. No, no, no. You, you take all the money, whatever you've saved after expenses, that is what you pay zakat on. 
in reality, if you have a rental property, you should sum the profits from your rental property that you've saved along with your you know, personal balances, like whatever is in your checking account. But if you have US dollars and then your stocks and you just combine them all into one figure, you see? And that becomes a very good and solid way uh, of, of uh, including the savings from your rental property. I won't recommend that you just treat the rental property as like a separate entity. Oh, I only saved a thousand dollars from the rental property. Then it's is 6,000. So I don't face the cat. No, no, no. You take that thousand, you add it to your personal savings. And then that total amount is what you face the cat. About. I hope that point is clear. If no intention with the property or fixed asset, then no zakat until intention is formed. This may seem like a person is avoiding the tax man, <laughs> but we don't see it as taxes. Remember, we see zakat as purification. We see this as a way of getting closer to Allah. A person legitimately could have no intention with property. This happens. People have land back home. They don't know what they're going to do with it, right? How is it fair for them to pay zakat on it? When they really, like, you know, think about the idea of zakat. Gold, right, and silver, back in the day, you pay zakat on. You would take a piece of the gold and give it as zakat. You would take a piece of the silver and give it as zakat. You would take one camel out of the 25 and give it as zakat, right? That's how zakat used to be. You would literally take something from your asset and you give it. Your cash, you would take some of it and give it as zakat. How can you do that with land or a house, right? You take like a bunch of bricks and give it as zakat. You can't do that, right? So it's not fair for that to be considered the same as cash or gold or silver or other assets. You see, this is the difference between the two items. The intention is formed. A person's like, I'm going to sell this property. Okay, great. Now, when you sell it and the money comes in your hand, then if you've saved it for a year, you pay zakat on it. If you don't have that, alhamdulillah, just wait until your intention is formed and there is no problem there. I hope that point is clear. A lot of people are confused by that. They're like, how this person is running away from zakat? In reality, inshallah, they're not. Okay, it's been, I've been talking for a while. Let's see if you all can get engaged again. And I hope a few more people will answer, inshallah. Okay, uh, tell me, from the following precious metals, is zakat due? Yes or no? Are you ready, people? You can say yes if you're ready. All right, alhamdulillah. But those I'm ready. Where it happened to the rest of the people? There were more people answering before. <laughs> All right, no problem. I will wrap it up quickly just to get to the point where we can go to the QA, inshallah. Okay, we already established that bullion, gold bullion, zakat is due on it. Yes, excellent. That is correct. Zakat is due on gold bullion that you bought as investment. You will pay zakat on it. What about? Gold that is in jewelry. And again, gold in jewelry is woman. No man's not supposed to wear that, right? Aha, we have a healthy mixture of yeses and noes. Or actually, there's only a few noes <laughs> and more, more yeses. Hmm. Above Nisab amount. Okay, so uh, Brother Muhammad Rahman says above Nisab amount. The way we're going to approach Nisab, and I'll get to that in the end of the slide, is we take all of our things all of our assets that are zakatable, money, the cash, gold, silver, stocks, we combine them all into one figure, okay? And then if that figure remains above nisab, then we pay zakat. We don't treat gold as in like, I'll see if the gold is above 85 grams. Uh, we don't look at it that, that way, okay? I hope that point is clear. Because everything we're doing is in the dollar amount, right? So, you know, and then this is something they mentioned in the books of fiqh, that if you have, you know, like, uh, right? that if you have uh, gold and silver, right, you can combine the two to, to reach nisab. You should, in fact, do that. Okay. So we apply that idea here, inshallah. Ah, now, so most of you said yes. One person, I think, said no. Okay. The answer here is it depends on the madhab you follow. And I'll tell you the differences or the madahib in a minute here. But the answer could be yes. The answer could be no. We'll see in a second. Okay. Um, 
Uh, say you have a Rolex, mashallah. You have a Roly. Do you pay zakat on it? I wish I had one, but no. <laughs> no zakat on a Roly. All right, perfect. And what about diamonds? Whether they are on their own or they're part of a ring. We have a few yeses, a few no. This is personal use. You're not a diamond. You're not selling diamonds, okay? By the way, if you're selling diamonds, if you're selling cars, if you're selling Rolexes, then that becomes a business commodity, right? That becomes the bread. Do you agree with that? If that's your business, then the Rolex becomes like the bread in our bakery analogy. Do you, are you all comfortable with that? Yes? So that's not what I'm referring to. I'm saying that this is for your own thing, like your own diamonds, okay? The answer to the diamond is no. There's no zakat on diamonds. Like this is good, I'll just buy diamonds. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about jewelry, right? Diamonds, by the way, across the board, whether you wear them or not, no zakat. It's not on every precious metal. Remember, zakat is reductive. It's not everything that's precious you pay zakat on. It's reductive. It's only paid on gold and silver, right? That's it. Think about the horse example. Horses are way more valuable than cows, right? But there's no zakat on horses. It's only on cattle. It's reductive. It's not anything that's valuable, okay? Look at this. Zakat bought for investment purposes, okay? Bullions, coins, bars, right? That you buy and store, whether it's in an investment account, whether it's just in a safety lockbox account, whichever way you do it, that you pay zakat on it. And you pay zakat on it by getting its value and adding its value to your checkings account, your investment account, everything together, that one amount, okay? Are you with me? This is consensus. There's no difference of opinion amongst the scholars about this. Folks, this is important. Zakat, or so gold or silver for investment purposes, everyone says you pay zakat on it. Are you all with me? Yay. All right. Precious metals, stones, gems, rubies, emeralds, sapphire. I don't even know what they look like. <laughs> all right. Rolexes, whatever that is precious and valuable. No zakat on it. No zakat on it. Mm -hmm. by consensus. Because again, zakat is not paid on everything valuable. It's not. It's only paid on a few limited reductive categories. What about jewelry? Jewelry that is worn by a woman. The position of Imam, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, is that you pay zakat on all jewelry. Okay, whether you wear it or you don't wear it, whether you are keeping it to give to your kids as heirloom, it doesn't matter. You pay zakat on it, end of story. That is the position of, of Imam Abu Hanifa. That is the uh, majority of the Muslim world. That's how they operate. Okay, so if you come from a country that is, you know, for, uh, you know, that has the Hanafi madhab as the uh, standard madhab, that's all of, you know, subcontinent, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that's all of Egypt, that's all of Turkey, right? That's like, mashallah, uh, that's all, like that's a very large portion of the Muslim world. You are probably following this position right here, the Hanafi position, okay? The Shafi'i, Hanbali, and Maliki position is no zakat on jewelry that is worn by a woman, okay? لا زكاة في أو يباح للنساء من الذهب والفضة ما جرت عادتهن بلبسه ولو كثر. Okay. Uh, in the books of fiqh they say it is permissible for women to to not pay zakat on jewelry that they wear as a عادة as a habit. Okay. Even if it's a lot ولو كثر. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, like, the amount is not important. It's the fact that they're wearing it. Why? Why, why would they say that? Uh, they say that's because 
uh, and you know, in the books of fiction, they give examples of like jewelry. I, I always chuckle at this one. They're like, oh, it's you know, like uh, bracelets and necklaces and rings, what dodge and a <laughs> and a crown. Like, bro, who's wearing crowns back in the day? What is going on, right? But anyway, so jokes aside, they say it doesn't matter what jewelry the woman is wearing. There's no zakat on it because it's like the clothes that she wears, right? It's like the clothing of the woman. Like there's no zakat on clothing. There's no zakat on the jewelry. That's the reasoning that's used by the Shafiris and Hanbalis and Malikis. The question is, what is jewelry that's worn regularly, right? Like what, what, what is that? Okay. Um, the, the, the answer to that is, it is something that you wear uh, you know like it's something that you wear at some point during during the year right uh, if you are wearing it uh, for a wedding you're wearing it for Eid you're wearing it for whatever it as long as you wear it no zakat on it if you don't wear it at all if you're just storing it in the lockbox, then it's more like the investment. You see? Then it's more like the gold bullion and the gold coin. So if you are following the position of Imam Muhanifa, you pay a zakat on all jewelry, no problem, across the board. Only the gold and silver, by the way. You have to be careful. You're not paying zakat on the precious metals or the stones, excuse me, like uh, diamonds and whatnot. If you're following the Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali position, then you pay zakat on the gold and silver. That's for investment, of course. But you don't pay zakat on what a woman wears regularly. As long as they're wearing it, it's fine. The area that becomes a little gray is what if she's not wearing it all at all? At all. It's just sitting in like, a, in like a safety deposit box in the bank. Then what I would say, my personal recommendation is, the jewelry that you have put away that you are not wearing and you haven't worn in a while, consider that to be like an investment and pay zakat on the gold and silver value of it. Any jewelry that you wear at any time is if following this position is exempt. Okay, I'll repeat this point. If you are following the position of Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed, any jewelry that's worn at any time occasions that are regular or irregular, don't pay zakat on it. But any jewelry that's just sitting in like a safety deposit box, untouched, unworn, that consider it to be like the gold and silver that is for investments. I hope this point is clear. Uh, the simple position is of the position of Imam Abu Hanifa that is all, all jewelry, inshallah. Okay, let me get to the end quickly because we want to get to the questions. Uh, cryptocurrencies, we're all masakin. If you bought cryptocurrency, <laughs> everything is down. But you treat cryptocurrency as cash and you pay the account on the full amount that is held. Okay. Uh, same thing with NFTs. I added this slide back when like it was really, it was a new thing and it was really cool. Now people have kind of like, I think it's kind of moved on from people's, uh, uh, like from the, uh, from, from, from the conversation. I feel like it's taking the backseat. Uh, but NFT is interesting because it, could be like a trade asset, right? Um, if it's a trade asset where someone's buying it like a stock, they want to increase it, it, it to increase its value, then you, um, you know, you pay zakat on it uh, accordingly, right? Um, you know, then it will be, you know, like 2.5% of the value of the NFT. But NFT could be a connect collectible item. Again, I don't know who does this as purely a collectible. I think most people do it for, reselling purposes to make a profit. But if it is a collectible, purely as a collectible, then there will be no zakat on it, right? It really depends on how you view it. I think most people have kind of moved off from NFTs anyway. But if you are buying for reselling purposes to make a profit, you pay zakat on the full value at the end of the lunar year. Okay, I hope that point is clear. Let's recap, okay? The questions we asked ourselves in the very beginning was, is the investment fully accessible, partially accessible, or inaccessible? We asked, what about did he, then we contributed to our investment? Was it a voluntary contribution or involuntary? We're like, what about the investment type? 
Is it like cash, gold, or silver, or is it like a business commodity? Right. Uh, these are the questions that we asked ourselves when we look at our zakat portfolio. And then the answer, bringing it all together, is as follows: things that you don't have access to, and you do not contribute voluntarily to. There is no zakat on it, like the CPP. Yes. Uh, investment accounts that you contributed voluntarily to and have full access, the entire amount is zakatable. Now let's look at your TFSA account. Your TFSA account, fully accessible, completely voluntary. Completely voluntary. You pay zakat on the full TFSA account. But you say to yourself, the stocks in my TFSA, I will see them as a business commodity. Yes? Then the business commodity you will calculate the zakat, uh, zakatable asset ratio, right? The ratio of how much if it is the bread and the dough and the flour versus how much if it is the oven and you pay zakat only on that portion using the formula we had described. But it's the full TFSA, the full holdings, okay? And then from that, you go down to either you see it as a business commodity or you see it as cash, you see? Partially accessible is a self-directed RSP. And brother Nadim, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong. Self-directed RSPs are accessible, but you will lose, your, you will be charged a withholding tax. And group RSPs are not accessible generally until person leaves a company or a certain amount of time has passed. Is that correct? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a certain amount that, that in a group RSP, you cannot take. Uh, and it, it depends on your employer and the plan that you're in. Right, exactly. So for the purposes of self-directed RSPs, you look at your self-directed RSP account and you say, you know what? 70% um, of it is accessible. Okay, so then the value 70% of that is now what you're being zakat on. And then within that 70%, you look at the, from the value perspective, you look at the stocks you have, and you say, okay, I will treat this as a business commodity. And again, you follow the calculation and you arrive at the zakat payment for 70% of that portfolio or 70% of the value of the portfolio, okay? Or you can say, I'm gonna treat it like cash and then 70% of the value of this portfolio, I'll pay zakat on all of it as if it is cash. That's the two, like the merging of our two uh, streams here, all right? Uh, coming back, coming to the last category, voluntarily contributed and cannot access the investments. Uh, RESPs are accessible. You, you know, like you as the person who put the money into RESP, you can take it out. Like the parent has the right to withdraw. But the moment the parent withdraws the money, the government grants are also then gone. Okay. And in reality, uh, the person who's putting RESP, and I, I speak about this as someone who invests for my children's RESPs, uh, is that your intention is not to take that money out, right? Any parent who puts the money in there, the intention is not to take it out. Your intention is to take it out when you put money in TFSAs or RSPs or just a non-registered account. Your intention is sometime, some point, I will take this out and use it, okay? But do you agree as a parent, your intention is not to take out the RESP money? Do you agree with that? Yes or no? You can disagree, it's okay. You can say, no, I don't agree with that. I don't have a problem. I just wanna see what the people think, right? Perfect. If that is how you view that money and the reason why you're putting that money in there is because you want the government grant, you want that government money, right? <laughs> and you want that to grow for your kids so that they can access it and they inshallah have uh, opportunities for education and not just education, they can use it for other things as well, right? If that is your intention, then I would say this money, you can't access it. You wait for your children to access it. Like the Bamar example, okay? So when the child withdraws for the first time, they pay zakat and then they use the money. You see, whatever is now accessible to the child and whatever, and, sorry, whatever specifically they're withdrawing from the RSP, when they reach that age, they pay zakat on it once and then they use it. And if it remains with them, they pay zakat on it for the next year if it's above the nisab, okay? And uh, that would continue every single year as they continue to access the RESP, 
that's how, in my opinion, it's the most fair way to go about it. If you were to say, I will be safe and I will pay zakat on all of my RSP contributions, alhamdulillah, I cannot fault you because you are going to take the opinion that I have access to it. That's fair. I cannot disagree with that. But what I'm saying is the parent, as we just did a quick like uh, informal survey here, but almost every parent I've talked to, not almost every parent I've talked to about RSP ever, their intention is never to touch that money. It's only for the children. So that is why I would say this is a better place for the RSP. And each of these individual accounts, you look at again, what's invested in it, it it's either cash or business commodity. And however you view it is how you calculate it. I hope now the two things have come together and have merged and become a little clearer, inshallah. Uh, let's jump to the end quickly because I think we have uh, the questions and they are, I think, more pertinent. Who gives zakat? You know, this is something that is, uh, you know, I think a very obvious part. We, all Muslims, male or female, must give zakat as long as the wealth meets in Islam. Uh, child, if the child is wealthy, like if a child is like a YouTube star and they're making a lot of money, mashallah, good for you, but also, uh, you know, caution. <laughs> but assuming your child has money, in reality, their money is under your guardianship. You pay zakat on their behalf. Same thing with the wealth of the orphan. Both things are there. Uh, and the deceased zakat is taken from the inheritance if it was due before the inheritance is distributed because it's a right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. In all reality here, uh, nisab, oh, so the zakat does not have a age limit. It's not like uh, salah or siyam, fasting and prayer. That, that's a, there's an age limit requirement for that. But for zakat, there is none of that. It applies across the board as long as the money reads, meets the nisab value. Okay, receive zakat. This is a in a longer discussion. I, I don't want to get into this right now. There's eight categories of this, just for the sake of brevity of time, right? But these eight categories are listed in surah number nine, ayah number 60. Surah number nine, ayah uh, 60, right here, excuse me. Okay, this is the reference. Excuse me, you can go back and look at it. Uh, here is the list in a list form. Uh, the first two uh, recipients are the most uh, worthy of zakat, the faqir and the miskin. The faqir, when I say zero to 50%, that means if they have a need, like if they need $10 a day to survive, the faqir has $5 or less. And the miskin has $5 to $10. This is actually how these scholars qualify faqir and miskin. Both of these are extremely worthy. Keep in mind that what miskin is who has 100%. Of their needs are being met, right? But this is a person who's living hand to mouth. They need ten dollars a day to survive. They have exactly ten dollars a day that they earn, and that's how they're living. So a miskin, a person who lives that way, they are actually recipient of zakat. They are eligible. And my personal just advice to you is to find people in our community, whether it's fa family from back home, whether it's you know neighbors and community members in the Muslim community here. Uh, you make if you can find someone who's in this situation, they're living hand to mouth, they have almost no savings, they have uh, you know, some, um, some, some uh, liabilities, something goes wrong and it's a disaster, you give them your zakat, you have given them breathing room, right? And that's a very beautiful, and their dua, Allahu Akbar, their dua will change your life. I can guarantee you that. When they make dua for you, right? That person who's working hard, but can't make it just because circumstances are not allowing them to rise above this level of maskana, and you become the person who helps them rise up, gives them a safety blanket, that dua is going to change your life. You can, uh, you know, you can count on it. Uh, the other categories, there's a lot of details uh, in the books of fiqh about what these specific uh, things are, who are these specific people, who qualifies. There's a lot more discussion there. I don't want to get into that. I want to take go to more of the questions. But in Allah's cause, the last part I will discuss briefly is this is where a lot of the uh, you know Islamic causes under this banner they raise money, like you know institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is legitimacy to that. This is not just illegitimate. They're not just trying to you know pull a quick one on you. There is legitimacy on that. If you see someone who's collecting money for zakat and they have a legitimate case to make it in Allah's cause, then it is okay, inshallah. But most definitely the first two categories are the most worthy without a doubt. 
uh, by the way, zakat recipients have to be Muslim. Okay, they have to be. They have to be Muslims. It cannot be a uh, a, a non-Muslim. Sadaqah can, can be given to any person who is Muslim or not. It doesn't matter. Okay, but zakat is specifically meant to be for Muslim. The Prophet said, "Tuqadu min aghniyahim, faturadu ala fuqaraihim." It's taken from the rich Muslims and given to the poor Muslims. Okay, he's specific about that because he added the pronoun there. It makes it specific, not general. It has to be a Muslim. Also not given to a Hashemite, right? From Banu Hashim or Bani Abdul Muttalib. This is really inapplicable today because it's it's hard to verify who's a Hashimi and who's a Muttalibi. It's really hard to do that today. But it is something that you may see some people never take zakat because they're like, we're from the family of the Prophet And if they feel that way, uh, then no worries. You you shouldn't like force them to take zakat. Okay, faqirun tahta ghani. This is the category in fiqh. They mention a poor person living under the care of a rich person, right? So a son is poor, but they're living with their dad, right? You can't give zakat to that poor son he, because he's living under the guardianship of his father still. And then here I'm saying a son who's a grown man, right? When they move out and now they're faqir on their own, then you give them zakat, no problem. Zakat is, is given... Is not given vertically in your family tree. You do not give zakat to your parents or grandparents. It's impermissible. You cannot give zakat to your children. It's impermissible. Okay. Also, you cannot give zakat to your dependents, like your wife. Okay. Um, and in reality, the wife shouldn't give zakat to the husband either. It is not a good thing. That's a difference of opinion for the wife and husband, wife to husband, but no difference of opinion for a man to or a person to their kids person to their parents and man to his wife absolutely not allowed uh, that is because they are your dependents they are your inheritors you don't give zakat to them you provide for them as an obligation that is why okay horizontally on the family tree is okay horizontally is brother sister uncle aunt cousin you know and you go off right in fact this is great they should be supported your family in fact should be the first recipients of your zakat, as long as their feelings are not going to be hurt, uh, if their feelings are okay, they're not, if they don't take it as a slight, most definitely I would encourage you to give zakat to your family members in that horizontal way of uh, the family tree. When to give zakat? This is the last part. It, look at this. This is a person's ba uh, you know balance of their total assets, right? This includes their stocks, their cash, everything, right? Maybe this is where like you know the uh, the interest rates were hiked and everything went down in the market and mashallah, this person's in the scheme now, okay? <laughs> so here is the Nisab line. The Nisab line right now, I put it in US dollars, it's 5,275 USD, okay? And just for the sake of this chart, this person is just above the Nisab, is he not? Yes? So at the end of, when they come to the first of Ramadan, because that's when they pay zakat, right? When they come to first of Ramadan, should they pay zakat? On the first of Ramadan, yes or no? What do you think, people? Yes, they should. Because they remained above the bare minimum threshold the entire year. And their year, their Islamic year, for them, they have said it begins in Ramadan. So alhamdulillah, they will pay zakat in Ramadan. But what happens, what happens if they dipped below the Nisab line, right? In Rajab here, they dipped below the Nisab line right before, a couple of months before Ramadan. Do they pay zakat in Ramadan even though they're back to like a healthy amount? Do they? What do you think, people? No, they don't. That's the correct answer. They don't because they have dipped before the Nisab. However, as Brother Muhammad Rahman says, if they pay it here, that will be considered ihsan, but it's not an obligation. Jazakumullah khairan. This is all that I have for you all today. Let's look at the questions now. Bi ibn Um Yeah. Uh, again, uh, Salakum Sheikh again. Uh, Jazakumullah khair for the presentation. Uh, you know, very, very informative. Uh, we do have some questions, and a lot of the questions, I think you were just tackling them as they were getting put up, but uh, maybe we'll start with uh, one right yeah. here. Um, uh, how do you calculate zakat for income earners and also owning credit cards? Hmm. 
uh, income earners. So you don't calculate zakat on income. You calculate zakat on what you have saved, right? And uh, credit cards, I mean, uh, you shouldn't really have credit card loans. It's okay to have a credit card as long as you pay off the balance. Uh, but you really should not carry the balance that is very dangerous for your finances. And also it's a riba that you're paying. Uh, so I don't understand. Uh, maybe they're saying they have a credit card debt. Uh, and if they do have a credit card debt, uh, then it goes back to the idea of loans. The loan is excluded, but that loan should be paid off ASAP uh, yes. and whatnot. Yeah. All right, we have another one here. Uh, in case I'm saving money to pay back a debt or loan, do I need, uh, do I still need to pay zakat for them? Also, mm. if I can remember exactly how much I had at a certain period and was supposed to give away the zakat, what do I do? That's a great question. Uh, so money that is being saved to fulfill an obligation, okay? Uh, so for a debt, as, as we had discussed, the, the, uh, the loan amount is already you know, going to be excluded because you don't own that money, yes? Um, but if a person is saving money, for example, to uh, say they have uh, made a commitment to buy a house, say a new build, okay? And they're saving money to uh, make the down payment for that house, all right? Now that's a large sum of money. If they've already signed the contract to purchase the home, then all the money they save for that house is excluded from zakat because that money is as if they've already given it to the vendor. This is waiting for the vendor to come back. Okay. So if it's a signed contract, it's done. You have to, it's due on that day. Even if it's, you know, a year or so out or whatever, it's fine. Money that's received to, for some other non-binding uh, matter, right? Like you're saving to buy something, you pay zakat on it because you haven't, committed it to anything right you could come back and say oh i didn't go and give it for the loan or i didn't go and buy that thing that could definitely happen in the future right so anything that is committed like say a down payment for a house or for a car or something you've already committed to that you've already signed the agreement then in that case whatever you're saving for it no zakat uh, but if you are saving it for something other than that without any commitment you pay zakat on it all right we have another one here. Uh, how do I calculate how much zakat I have to pay on cash? Like, how do I calculate how much amount I have accumulated in the year? So if in the beginning of the Islamic year, I had 15,000, and at the end of the Islamic year, I had 20,000, do I have to pay zakat on 20 or 20 minus 15? Excellent question. Uh, so this is, I, I think I rushed this at the end. If you, if a person, I think most people will pay zakat in Ramadan, so you pick say the first of Ramadan or any day in Ramadan as your day of giving zakat, okay? Then on that day, you look at all your assets, right? And I'm, again, I'm pointing here in like the first of Ramadan. So in this chart, it's 15,000. That's what you look at and you pay zakat on that amount. In reality, the, that 15,000 hasn't been with you for, whole, for the whole year. Oh, actually, I should go back to slide here. That's the one, the rest, right? That 15,000 hasn't been with you the whole year. But that is okay because the time we live in, we have scheduled payments that come into our account, you know, paychecks and whatnot. And we have scheduled, you know, expenditure, expenditures that go out at a, at a schedule. So it's hard to track exactly how much each cash amount that you got was with you for how, uh, for an extended period of time. It's very hard to track that. So we take a sum and we take the sum on a particular day. And that is the safest and the most uh, easiest way, inshallah. For this person, they will look at it on the day of the zakat, the first of Ramadan, and then on that day, calculate all their assets and that sum, that number on that, they will pay 2.5% zakat. All right, exactly for that. Uh, I think this was mentioned, but I'll answer it anyway. Uh, if lira is not zakatable, do we pay zakat for the previous years when it is accessible to us or only pay for year and onwards? So Lira, Nadim, it becomes accessible when you reach. So yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I can, uh, you know, but most of the Liras are essentially, um, you know, somebody who's maybe left an employer at a pension mm -hmm. and they take the cumulative value of it. So mm -hmm. I, I haven't really had any, um, maybe, or maybe if the, 
brother or sister can kind of be a little bit more specific on their situation because I've never really seen in um, money going to a lira that wasn't previously locked. So it's always been consistently locked. Uh, I, so I would say that. And the other thing is, of course, the lira only becomes accessible when you uh, when you retire um, and you actually convert it to a lift. So the, the, I guess the, the correct answer would be when the lira be becomes converted to a lift, that's when mm -hmm. it becomes possible. Mm, okay. Right? Awesome. Um, Okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, how, how to calculate zakat on 18 karat uh, gold jewelry, which is mainly steel with gold plating. Mm. Uh, you take the value of that, whatever the that jewelry, whatever its value is, uh, say 18 karat jewelry has like a lower value, uh, whatever the amount of that is, you would add that to your total savings uh, and you pay zakat on the total amount. All There's right. a question someone asked here on the QA. I know, sorry, in the chat, I know we're going by the QA, but I just wanted to address that before the example is misunderstood. Uh, when I said you can not, you don't pay zakat on the loan, that does not mean the cost of living. That does not mean rent or utilities or bills. That's you know, This is not a tax. This is your savings, right? The reason why we're excluding a loan is because that is money that you don't own, that you have, right? That's what we're saying. And we have loans that are so long-term now that we have to come up with a mechanism to map them to a shorter term, one year duration. So this is why we come up with this calculation for that, okay? It's not for rent or whatnot. It's only the loan amount that's subtracted, inshallah. Inshallah. All right, um, another one here. If one has 100,000 in RSP invested in long-term investments, do they count the 30,000 as zakatable asset? I'm assuming they're talking, it's in a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. um, also, as this amount is registered, do they then also deduct the applicable withholding tax? For example, Ontario, Canada, it's 30% uh, for that amount, which becomes 9,000. So zakat on 100,000 in this example is 225. <laughs> is that correct? Uh, that doesn't look right. <laughs> so 100,000 RSP. Yeah. Why? Why would they say it's counting as thirty thousand? You said something in the mutual fund. So, like, so, yeah. so thirty thousand would be the withholding tax. So if you were to take that hundred thousand, yeah. you would would try it. The government takes thirty. Thirty. So that correct. Means you're you're left with seventy. Seventy. Right. Again, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, would you apply the zakatable ratio before on a hundred or the seventy? So what the I think you would apply the way to go about it. Say you have go by about it as if it's the business commodity, right? Yeah. It's a calculable asset ratio. You would calculate it for the entire portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. And then for the hundred k, say your zakat comes out to um, say two thousand dollars, just for the sake of argument, right? Because of the ratios. Then from that two thousand, you take seventy percent of it, which would be fourteen hundred, and you give that as zakat. Okay. All right. That yeah. makes sense. All right. Uh, one second here. Uh, what about money saved to extend the house living? Like ma making second floor as a space is not sufficient for the family. Uh, excellent question. As long as it's committed, no zakat. If you signed with a contractor saying, I will pay you this money, or you signed with a builder or with a car dealer, a contract that when I get the car, I will pay you this money. That is exempt. But if it's not, is this something you're saving? If you've had it for a year, you give zakat for it at the end of the year. All right. So a couple more, and then I think we'll we'll call it the day. Uh, mm -hmm. Is zakat due ca uh, on cash being saved for Umrah or Hajj? Same idea. If you have committed, put a down payment for the Hajj group, and mashallah, you're now waiting for them to. <laughs> service your, your their commitment uh, then yes you can then exclude not pay zakat on that because you already made the commitment no commitment you're just saving because you want to go well until you go <laughs> you pay zakat on it yeah exactly yeah. alright last one is going to be an easy one what do you think of the Raptors uh, playing chances do you think do you think they're going to do any damage in the playoffs <laughs> uh, if they get into the playoffs they're probably going to play Milwaukee and I don't think they'll win like even one game. So mm -hmm. unfortunately it's it's been a tough season. All right. All right. <laughs> but All right. you know, maybe maybe we get some good uh, lottery uh, you know odds and you know 
get someone nice. <laughs> yeah, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, so, Zakhar <laughs> Khair Sheikh, uh, for for uh, you know um, sharing your thoughts and and your information with us, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, also, Brother Riyad, uh, thanks for joining us uh, as well, uh, showing, telling us a little bit about some of the good work that you guys have been doing. Um, if there are any uh, uh, questions about uh, myself, uh, you know, Penny Peel or or Sheikh uh, Ari Janwar, please reach out to us. Um, as mentioned before, uh, you know this is a topic on zakat. So I would like to end by saying that you know one of the one of the value things that we do add is uh, we do provide our clients with zakatable ratio, uh, asset ratios. Um, again, we don't we as as portfolio managers don't give them we don't tell them what their zakat is. We just simply give them the tools, and at that point, you know it's incumbent upon them. Um, so with that. Um, you know, I'd like to say Zakalah Khair again. And, uh, you know, I wish everybody who attended a, a very uh, Ramadan Mubarak and, you know, may Allah accept our fast and, um, you know, and, and our prayers during this holy month, inshallah. Amen. 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 Right. Zakalah Khair. Oh, yeah. Salaam alaikum. Salaam